Today we're going to look at an ancient Greek method for approximating the square root of 2. And this is due to Theon of Smyrna. And it makes this approximation via recursively defined sequences. So let's set x0 equal to y0 equal to 1. And then for n bigger than or equal to 0, we'll define xn plus 1 to be xn plus yn. And then yn plus 1 to be 2xn plus yn. And it's not that xn or yn on their own approximate the square root of 2, it's that their quotient approximates the square root of 2. So let's look at some example calculations. So x1 is 2 and y1 is 3, that's evident from this rule over here. That makes x1 over y1 3 over 2, and notice the error there is 0 0.0858. So that's already fairly good for an approximation. At the next step, we have x2 is equal to 5 and y2 is equal to 7, giving us an approximate value of 7 over 5, and our error is a little bit better now. It's 0 0.0142. Then down here at the fourth step, we have an approximation of 41 over 29, and now the error is really quite small. It's 0.00042, around there at least. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is prove that this is indeed a good approximation by showing that the limit of this quotient is indeed the square root of two using modern methods. So when I said modern methods, I could have meant a lot of different things, but we're gonna start off with some linear algebra. So let's set a vector Vn equal to the vector with components Xn and Yn. And now let's notice that the following recursion can be written in matrix vector form as Xn plus one, Yn plus one equals the matrix one, one, two, one times the vector Xn, Yn. But if we introduce the notation of A being equal to this matrix, one, one, two, one, then that's equivalent to the following maybe more compact form, which is our our vector Vn plus 1 equals A times Vn. But notice now we can like take that all the way down to the ground if you will. So this is going to be equal to A squared times Vn minus 1 or A cubed times Vn minus 2 all the way down we could have this is equal to A to the n plus 1 times V0. But maybe that's not exactly the indexing we would want. This is a nice indexing to reproduce this formula, but I think maybe it would be a bit better for our purposes to make the following observation, which is xn, yn is equal to vn, which is equal to the matrix an times v0. And then you might say, well, what's V0? Well, V0 is the vector made of X0 and Y0, so it's the vector made of 1, 1. Okay, so now all we need to do is find some sort of uh, general rule for the nth power of this matrix A. But the way we'll do that is by diagonalizing the matrix, which means we need eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And we'll start by determining the eigenvalues of A, meaning we need to look at the characteristic polynomial. So I'll call that PAX. And this is equal to the determinant of A minus X times the identity matrix. So let's recall that that will be the determinant of, let's see, our matrix will look like one minus X, one, two, and then one minus X. So something like that. But then we can find this determinant and we'll see that we get X minus one squared minus the number two. There I use the fact that those pick up a minus sign so when we square we can just switch the order of subtraction but the eigenvalues occur exactly at the roots of this characteristic polynomial. So that tells us we should set PAX equal to zero and solve for X. So what will that leave us with? That'll leave us with X minus one squared equals two after moving some things around.
Now we can take the square root, get, leaving us with x minus one equals the square root of two, or x minus one equals negative square root of two. We should have two roots, meaning that we have x equals one plus the square root of two, or x equals one minus the square root of two. So, so those will be our two eigenvalues. And maybe we'll call this one lambda one and this one lambda two just for ease of use. Then the next thing that we need to do is find the eigenvectors. So here's our matrix setup for our recursively defined sequences. Let's recall that the eigenvalues of this matrix A were one plus root two and one minus root two. Now we'd like to find the corresponding eigenvectors starting with lambda one. Let's recall in order to do that, we need to look at the null space of the matrix A minus lambda one times the identity. This is the standard strategy of finding eigenvectors after knowing the eigenvalue. So after a bit of simplification, that'll give us the null space of the matrix, which is minus the square root of two, one, two, and then minus the square root of two. But let's recall that the null space is invariant under row reduction. So we can go ahead and row reduce this. Let's notice that this second row and this first row, they are multiples of each other. If you, for example, multiply this first row by negative square root of two, you get exactly the second row. So that means by row combinations, we can get rid of one of those rows. Let's maybe get rid of the first row and then shift the second row up into its place. So that means that this is the same thing as the null space of the matrix two minus root two, zero, zero. Okay, good. So now let's say if a vector AB is in the null space of two minus square root of two, zero, zero, then that tells us that this vector is not only in the null space of our starting matrix right here, which means it's an eigenvector, but also that it's quote unquote killed by this matrix. So in other words, this matrix multiplies into this vector and gives us zero. So in other words, two minus root two, zero, zero, multiplied into A, B, must give us the zero vector. That's what it means to be in the null space. But let's see, that's gonna give us an equation involving A and B. We have two A minus the square root of two times B zero must be equal to the zero vector. We have some freedom here with our choices of A and B, which makes sense because anything in the eigenspace, it's scalar multiple will also be in the eigenspace. So let's, for example, set B equal to two, and that'll lead us to see that A must be in fact equal to the square root of two. So that means that we've got an eigenvector associated with this eigenvalue of, let's see, it will be of the form square root of two, two. Okay, nice. And now maybe I won't calculate the eigenvector for lambda two, but um, we'll bring that on the board and then we'll do our diagonalization. So we worked through calculating our first eigenvector to be square root of two, two. I've called this W1 to go with lambda one. And then through exactly similar methods, we could calculate our eigenvector W2 to go with lambda two to be minus root two, two. And now we'll use our diagonalization theorem from a standard linear algebra um, course. So we know that if we set P equal to the matrix whose rows are those eigenvectors, so, or columns I should say, so the first column is W1 and the second column is W2, so in other words, the entire matrix is the square root of two, two, minus the square root of two, two, then, P inverse times A times P is our diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues on the diagonal. So here we'll have lambda one, which is one plus square root of two. And then here we'll have lambda two, which is one minus square root of two. Okay, but let's notice that I'll call this D for just a second, just to keep it simple. And then we can also solve this for A. So this will tell us that A is equal to P times D times P inverse. Just left multiplying by P and right multiplying by P inverse. Okay, 
But now note that we get A squared is equal to P D P inverse times another P D P inverse. This is the first copy of A, this is the second copy of A. But I think you can see what's gonna happen. This P inverse and P cancel to the identity matrix, meaning we simply get P times D squared times P inverse. And you can follow this process inductively to get the following result, which is used all of the time in these scenarios. And that is a to the nth power is equal to p, d to the nth power times p inverse. Now we just have to calculate those out. So we've got p on the board, so that's gonna be root two, two, minus root two, two. And then d to the n power is super easy because that's a diagonal matrix. So this is one plus the square root of two all raised to the n power, and then one minus the square root of two all raised to the n power in the lower right diagonal. And then we'll have p inverse. Now you can calculate p inverse using a standard strategy for inverses of two by two matrices. I'll leave that to, for you to look up but you end up with something like this. Square root of two over four in that entry, a quarter here, negative radical two over four here, and another quarter there. So that is in fact P inverse. Great, and then from here perhaps all you'd need to do is multiply this out. But instead of multiplying it out like this, let's notice that this gives us a nice formula for our x n y n. So we in fact have x n y n is equal to this p d to the n p inverse times our like initial vector, which is one one. Okay, so let's start with that at the top, and then we'll work towards the end. Okay, so this is where we ended up. I changed it a little bit. Notice that every term in this matrix over here had a quarter in it, and I just pulled that out of the whole thing. Okay, now I'm gonna start combining. So I'll start by multiplying these two matrices as well as these two matrices, or really this is a matrix and a vector, maybe a better way to think of that. So let's see, what will we get for this yellow product? So let's recall that we need to swivel the first row into the first column. So this will give us a square root of two times one plus square root of two to the n power in that term. And then similarly here we'll have minus root two and then one minus root two to the n power here. Then here we'll have two and then one plus the square root of two to the n power from swiveling this row into this column. And then very similarly, two, one minus root two to the n power in that entry. And then we do the same thing here for matrix vector multiplication. So we'll take this first row, swivel it into the column vector, and then overlap and add. So this, that'll be one plus root two here and then one minus root two here. And now all that's left is to multiply this matrix by that vector, and then we'll have a closed form for our x n and our y n. So let's see, the cool thing is, is that when this swivels out, this one plus root two to the n will add up with this one plus root two, giving us a one plus root two to the n plus one. So carrying this root two out front, we have root two and then one plus root two to the n plus one. And then a similar thing will happen here, but we'll have minus root two, and then one minus root two to the n plus one. So that's our first entry. So when that first entry is multiplied by a quarter, that will be our xn term. Then for the second entry, we'll do the same kind of thing. We'll have two, and then one plus root two to the n plus one. And then here we'll have, um, plus two times one minus root two to the n plus one for very similar reasons. And now this one quarter times this term will be our y n term. But let's zero in on what our y n divided by x n term because that's the thing that's supposed to approximate the square root of two. So let's notice that the quarters will cancel because those are common factors of x n and y n. And the xn has a square root of two as a factor, 
The y-n has a two as a factor. So that means a two comes out of the numerator and a square root of two comes out of the denominator, meaning we can cancel that out to a square root of two. And after doing that, we'll have one plus root two to the n plus one. Let's see, plus one minus root two to the n plus one. So that's in the numerator. That's what's left over from this y-n component after all of that simplification. Then in the denominator, we'll have one plus root two to the n plus one minus one minus root two to the n plus one. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And now from here, we can take the limit. But notice that one minus root two in each of these, that number is somewhere between negative one and zero. The important part is its absolute value is less than one. So since the absolute value of these numbers are less than one, when we let n approach infinity, these will trend off towards zero. So each of those are trending off towards zero as n is approaching infinity. But that leaves us with this one plus root two to the n plus one over itself, which means that everything that's left over trends to the number one. But we've got this square root of two out front, so that means the limit in the end is the square root of two, but that's exactly where we wanted to get. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you wanna get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.